Good morning. My name is David Mather. I am the National Register Archaeologist at the State Historic Preservation Office. Uh, I'll be talking about a group of um, artifacts, bone, hair pipe beads that were found in far northwestern Minnesota um, decades ago. And um, I was approached a few years ago um, to help try to find um, a way to donate these to a museum. And this is the story of what happened after that. So there's 105 of these beads. They are, it's kind of a remarkable archeological assemblage because they're all one thing. Um, they were found by a private individual in the 1980s, somewhere near the Canadian border. Um, all that the present owner of the beads knew was that they were found in mud and um, somewhere way up there. Um, and the, the, that person, the person that found them gave them to someone else. That person was the one that wanted to donate them to a museum. And so um, I thought this was a really unusual and interesting um, facet of Minnesota's archeological record. And so I wanted to, to try to do a little study to document them and, and hopefully interpret them um, a bit. And at, after doing that, I facilitated donation of the of the beads to the Kitson County Historical Society, which is a, a reasonable guess um, from what little we know about the, the provenience. But you can see how weathered they are. They are um, um, made of bone, presumably cow bone, as I'll explain. Um, in some cases, you can see some red pigment on here, which alarmed me a little bit at first. And I'll, um, cause I thought I was, I was afraid they could potentially um, or that could potentially indicate that they were from a burial. Um, I will explain why I, I came to conclude that that is not the case. Um, so we don't know a lot about provenience here as, um, you know, provenience is the gold standard for archeologists in terms of historical and scientific value. Um, best cases that we're piece, we have something piece plotted within a site. Um, in this case, what we have is better than nothing. It's a uh, it's a general region that we can say that these things came from. Um, and so I'll explore that a little bit, given the historical context of Northwestern Minnesota and the unusual um, and recent context of these beads, I was able to do a little bit more um, with this than we might for some other type of find that is for which the provenience is so poorly known. Um, so in this paper, I'll talk about the beads first, then I will um, talk a bit about the fur trade context, and then um, I'll move on to implication, or I'll conclude with implications for Minnesota archaeology. So a hair pipe uh, bead is a long tubular bead. These are about four inches long, approximately. Um, these beads fit that type of definition. And they became popular in the um, in the 19th century, so fairly recently. And um, and they were first made of shell, as I'll describe. Then they were made of bone. Um, they are still used today, um, and they're very popular today. So, of all the types of archaeological research I've done over the years, I don't know that there's one that fits quite um, as far into the or extends quite as far into the present as as this one does. It's been interesting to consider in that regard. Um, for example, um, this is in 2019 when I was in Albuquerque for the Society for American Archaeology meeting. I happened to stop in, into a bead shop I noticed. And here are um, very similar types of hair pipe beads. They had four to, um, uh, in a package sold for 250. These are made from water buffalo bone. And the proprietor there explained to me that the bone ones and they were imported from India. They have these, the white ones. Um, and then these, these brown ones are also water buffalo and they're, they're just antiqued with coffee to give a, a kind of an older look. And these black ones are made from water buffalo horn. So there are um, two slightly different forms when I looked at these things. Um, and I measured a lot of them, um, or I made six measurements per bead. Um, so I measured the length, the midpoint diameter, and then the ends and the bore diameter at the ends. But you can see the two forms here. Here's the, the blunt um, ends um, and then these tapered ends and the tapered ones are slightly longer. You can see some of the red pigment 
um, on the on these blunt ones. And so first, I just kind of plotted these some of these um, some of the data to see if there were patterns. The blunt beads cluster really, really tightly. The tapered beads not quite so much, but this scale is really, really small. Um, each square is one millimeter, so um, these are minor differences, but but distinct differences. Same thing for the plot of the the end exterior and the bore diameter. So here's the the blunt. And here's the tapered, um, and you know, two clusters, but but very close to one another again. And then here's one more. This is the the um, the length, and um, and it shows that the two forms, the yellow is blunt, and the white is tapered. That while close to one another, they they do clearly clearly separate. And so here's a lot of statistics. You do not need to read all of these charts, but it's a summary of the data. So uh, mean, median, and then range for each of the um, measurements that I made. The important part here is the um, inferential statistics because I, I did a, just a simple t-test to see, um, to assess whether the differences between um, the two bead forms were um, you know, a, a kind of a, a, a coincidence, a natural overlap, or whether they were um, actually distinct. Um, in statistics, the p-value of less than 0 0.05 is generally considered to be st statistically significant. And what I thought was very interesting about this is that the p-values for all of these measurements were exponentially smaller than that. And so um, incredibly, uniform dimensions. Um, and I think that is significant to interpretation of the find. So we have two different types of or, uh, groups of, of otherwise similar artifacts, but each of those groups is very, very consistent um, within its own, with, within itself. Almost like it is, um, they are factory settings, which indeed they were um, in the seven, or in the 1700s there arose an industry on the East Coast um, of factory produ production of wampum beads from shell. And by the late 1700s, that had kind of switched over to create, to making hair pipe beads out of shell. And this is all from conch shell, which was uh, recovered from, from ship's ballast. Um, I was fascinated as I got into this to realize that John Ewers from the Smithsonian Institution had written a whole treatise on hair pipe beads in the 1950s. And so he described that that um, switch to making shell hair pipe beads um, occurred around the time of the American Revolution. Um, and here's a diagram from his, from his publication. You can see the different stages of manufacture with some of the finished beads over here on the right. And then significantly around 1880, there was a shift to making these out of cow bone. Um, and so I think for one thing, it was cheaper and more readily available than the, than the conch shell. Um, but also there was um, um, people who were, were trading in Indian communities realized or were reporting that the, the bone stems for corn cob pipes were very, very popular and people were buying them and using them to use as beads. And so anyway, the, the, the production of of um, hair pipe beads switched over to, to cow bone. This is the metacarpal and this is the metatarpal, or excuse me, metatarsal. These are the lower bones right above the hoof at the, at the bottom of the leg. Here, this, this finished bead is very similar to ours. And there's the, what it looks like on the end. So for the fur trade, um, beads are, you know, beads are a relatively rare thing to find. They are most like most often found in fur trade contexts, although they are truly ancient in North America. Um, in terms of fur trade contexts where beads are found, usually trading posts, often native villages, where there's lots of beads, it seems like they're often from a grave or a burial recovery type of thing and uh, or burial rescue. And, I, and that's what made me really nervous about, especially with that red pigment. Um, but I realized that there's something about this Con, or this assemblage is different in that all of these other contexts, you have a diversity of artifact types. You might have a lot of beads, but you'll have a lot of different types of beads. 
Um, and then, but, but, and usually lower numbers of each type. And so this seems to be different. Although I, you know, I am speculating to some degree. Um, and so there's a different type of context, which I think is really relevant for the, to this find, which is um, the, the context of a trade route. And so um, an example of that is the Voices from the Rapids project um, in the 1960s, where the Minnesota Historical Society and the Royal Ontario Museum were doing underwater archeology span on the fur trade routes. And they were um, investigating places where it was likely that fur trade canoes had capsized. And sure enough, they found clusters of identical items where they were the, the trade casks, the, the containers carrying the objects had sunk to the bottom and there they still were. So here's this group of musket balls. Here's all these trade kettles that were all nested together. There's other one, there's axes, there's awls, there's beads, there's all sorts of stuff, but they're like in these I, clusters of identifiable, I, or excuse me, identical things. Um, so, and so that comes back to our um, two types of beads. And one important thing about these is, is that there doesn't, they don't seem to have been made into anything. There's no um, like visible wear from string or cording. There's no cording in there. Um, there's no other types of beads. Um, if these were, um, you know, if these were made into, or I, I would say they're not, they were not made into the, into anything that someone would have been wearing when they when it, they entered the archaeological record. It seems to me that these are consistent with lost or or abandoned casks of of um, beads that were still packaged for trade, and the the staining. Um, seems pretty consistent with red vermilion or Ch Chinese vermilion, which was a popular fur trade item as well. And again, speculating, but it seems very likely that that could have been, um, could have occurred by accident, either as, as goods got wet, either in transit or after they were lost or abandoned. So in terms of the context, Northwestern Minnesota, here's Kitson County right here. There's the international border. There's the Red River, which is a border with present day border with North Dakota. Um, you see all the Red River trails coming in here from you know, early to mid 19th century. And so this is a trail network that was operated by Métis traders who went from, who were going from what's now Winnipeg um, down to St. Paul, way off the map here. There were a few central places were kind of stopping points on this network of trails but really nowhere is comparable to Pembina um, on the Red River here at the junction or at the confluence with the Pembina River. And this is, um, the trails come out like spokes of a wheel here and, um, and several of them go through um, Kitson County. Um, and you can see um, some of them here on the trig map um, and there's, but there's also railroad grades and there's, and there's um, stage roads and things like that by the late 19th century. And so by the time that the, that bone hair pipe beads were made, it was after um, the, the, the primary use of the Red River trails, but certainly the ox cart trails would have still been used at least locally. And these other types of roads were in, were in use then as well. All of this made me think of the, um, Minnesota Shippo's efforts to document and designate linear historic properties back in the 80s and early 90s, and including one section of Red River Trail, the Goose Lake Swamp section, which was listed in, in 1989. Um, we revived this a little bit um, in 2014 with nomination of um, a stagecoach road segment in Cass County, and this is the first one that was looked at um, in an interdisciplinary way in terms of archaeology as well as the structure of the road and as well as landscape. And um, Christy Homan Kane and Grant Goltz um, identified this area and nominated it to the National Register. And um, it includes all three resource types. Um, and so it, they found that it had, it had significance under National Register criterion A and D, um, local significance. Um, period of significance from 1891 to 1930. So more recent than the Red River Trails, not that different from the age of, of bone hair pipe beads. In general, um, all this led me to think that we need to take a new look um, 
the time is right for um, a fresh look at the Red River Trails and other linear historic properties, but looking at them from the perspective of archaeology and landscape as well. Um, and the way to do that um, is through LIDAR and photogrammetry at first, I think followed then from an archaeological survey, made this, maybe this would be a good statewide survey um, project. Um, but, and that, that, that the spokes of that wheel coming out from Pembina, I think would be the ideal um, place to start. And thank you very much. Oh, and if you're interested in this, this will be, this, there's an essay um, on this that'll come out in a book um, either later this year or next. Thank you.